For Morningstar, I'm Jeremy Glazer. We recently launched a dedicated economic moat section in our premium stock analyst reports. I'm here with Heather Brilliant. She's the global director of equity research to talk about the importance of economic moats and the best way to use this new section. Heather, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. So let's talk a little bit about uh, what an economic moat is. I know it's a term we talk about a lot, um, but you know, what exactly does it mean? You know, how should investors be thinking about it? So we use the term economic moat to connote a sustainable competitive advantage. And um, importantly, an economic moat rating has been available as part of the premium service for a long time. And what we're really doing now is trying to give investors a little bit more insight into how we arrive at that economic moat rating or why we think a company has a moat or not. And so when you read the section, you can really get a deeper sense of, well, why is this company a wide moat or narrow moat? Or even why doesn't it have a moat? And so uh, I think that will really enhance the the direct applicability of some of the research to the ratings that we've been putting out for some time. So what are some of the uh, you know, structural advantages that a company can have that uh, will give it an economic moat? Well, there's really five main ways we've identified a company can carve out an economic moat within its industry. Uh, and the first would be a cost advantage. And so cost advantage is really just the idea that uh, you know sometimes a company can actually produce something or have a process that results in better efficiency and produce something at a cheaper, cheaper cost than its competitors. Uh, the second would be intangible assets. And this refers to brands or patents that compel a consumer to pay more. And uh, so Tiffany is, is kind of the quintessential example of this, since they sell a commodity item that is literally worth more simply because of the brand. And um, the third would be switching costs. And switching costs is really um, focused on the concept that uh, sometimes it's more costly to switch to another provider. Even if that other provider might be offering something that could be perceived as better or cheaper, the customer doesn't always want to switch to it because the cost of switching is so great. And um, banking is actually one of these examples where you, know, you see a lot of individuals not switching from one bank to another, even if their fees go up, even if they experience some difficulty because the, the cost of switching is just so irritating. And the, the fourth source of competitive advantage is the network effect. And here we're looking for companies that um, really see the value of their business increase as the number of users increase. So we talk about Facebook as a kind of a, a timely example, I guess you could say, of this, um, particularly because you know Facebook has a, one of the largest networks we've ever seen developed anywhere with more than a billion users globally. Now they're still in the process of figuring out how to monetize this to its fullest, but we believe that network is extremely powerful and will result in, in opportunities to monetize it. And the final type of competitive advantage is, the, is called efficient scale. And here we're looking for markets that really aren't large enough to support another competitor. So um, it's very distinct from economy economies of scale, which is really part of a cost advantage. Efficient scale is the idea that um, some companies are operating in a market that another competitor could not effectively compete in and make a profit. So um, I, I talk a lot about the New Zealand market when we're referring to, uh, to efficient scale. And that's really because in New Zealand, the market's very small and very remote. Um, and there are a lot of companies there that make excess returns. But if another company were to enter into a variety of, of industries within New Zealand, then neither the existing player nor the new entrant would earn excess returns. And so that knowledge and, and the research of that really keep competitors out. So why should investors care about moats then? Uh, you know, does it make sense to only invest in wide moats? You know, how do you think about uh, it from an investing standpoint? How important is, is, the, is the moat to that analysis? Well, on, on the most fundamental level, we believe that companies with moats will are worth more than companies without. So because of their ability to compound returns over time and to sustainably reinvest in businesses or in their core business that earns excess returns going forward. So um, both of those factors make a, a business that is otherwise equal, that's a wide moat, worth more than a comparable comparable business that doesn't have a moat or that is not earning those excess returns. Um, the other thing I would say is we, we've done a lot of research around moats over the years. And one thing we found is that moats can really reduce the risk in your portfolio as well. So we have found that a company that has a wide moat is um, much less likely to go bankrupt than a company with no moat, and also much less likely to cut its dividend. And so those are, are really powerful ways to, to reduce the risk in your portfolio. How does valuation play into this? So, you know, is it worth paying up for these uh, wide mode stocks? Maybe paying a little bit higher valuation for the better business quality? 
We still think it makes sense to buy any stock when it's trading at a discount to that fundamental valuation. But there's two ways that we do think we end up requiring less of a discount for a wide moat company. The first is that the cash flows are generally easier to forecast, and it's easier to understand how they earn excess returns. So because of that, our wide moat companies typically have lower uncertainty ratings than our no moat companies. Uh, and the second is that we believe that wide moat businesses can compound excess returns for longer periods into the future. And so we do literally see a higher valuation because of that. You see them earning excess returns in our model for a longer period of time than you would for a business that doesn't have a moat. And so inherently, a wide moat business is worth more, which, which ends up being you know, relatively equivalent to the idea that you would, you would be willing to pay up for it. Um, all that being said, though, we would definitely recommend waiting for a discount to fair value when, whenever possible, including with wide moats. And I stress that because we've looked over time at the performance of wide moats versus the performance of wide moats trading at a discount. And um, if you just buy wide moats, you generally perform relatively in line with the market. But if you buy wide moats at a discount, we have seen extremely strong outperformance that it seems very persistent over long periods of time, um, particularly over the last 10 plus years. But what do you do in an environment where there might not be any uh, wide mode stocks that trade net at a big discount? Does that mean you kind of have to sit on your hands and wait for the market to fall? Well, it really does depend on the investor, and there's a few different ways that that I would handle that. And I would, I guess, I would say first that um, you know, for a lot of investors are willing to pay up a little bit more for a company with a moat. We still don't think you should pay above fair value, but anything below fair value gives you a cushion. And so, since those wide moat businesses can compound excess returns, uh, you you should still do pretty well. And I think Mastercard is a good example of this. You know, Mastercard is trading at a premium to our fair value right now, but it still does return. You know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 10, 15, 20 percent a year because it's so good at reinvesting in this business of basically being a, a toll operator within the financial services industry. So that's a business that we'd love to own if it were trading at even a small discount. That would be one, I would say, to put on your radar and be willing to, to buy at even a small discount to fair value. Heather, thanks for the update today. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. For Morningstar, I'm Jeremy Glazer.